Thanks. Yeah. Um, so hello everyone. I'm just gonna go over that near Max and introduce it. <laughs> so sorry about this delay we have here with uh, with us Max today. Max is from Ecole Polytech. Apparently he was at my talk in November. I'm sorry, I don't remember. <laughs> I'm so glad you reached out when you were in Turkey and you know agreed to give give this talk. Um, Max is Max's great success in his CV. He apparently he got an ERC starting grant and recently he has been awarded the ERC consolidator grant. He has like eleven paper best paper awards or nominations. What else do I remember? European Young Researcher Graphics Researcher Award. Did I say it correctly? Yeah. yeah. Yes. <laughs> and and you know like all these awards that you can get at this age, I guess he has them. And we are very happy to have him with us today. He will be here until 3 p.m. or so. If you want to talk to him, just let me know and we will arrange it. We will go to lunch after the talk together if you want to join. And Max, okay. stage is yours. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Fatma, for, uh, first of all, for helping to arrange this talk and for like all this, you know, help me up to the last minute. I mean, this, uh, yeah, this, uh, you know, a joint uh, collaborator <laughs> project. Yeah, so um, I wanted to talk a little bit about our work that basically the title of my talk is Efficient and Robust Learning on Non-Rigid Surfaces and Graphs. And this is joint work with many people that I will um, be uh, naming as I go along. And um, basically the main thing I wanted to convey in my talk today, is not, it's not a talk about a particular paper or a particular method, it's more kind of an overview talk about some of the things that I've been working on with you know, my students and, and colleagues. And I just hope that this gives you an introduction to this area. And if any of this looks interesting to you, I'll be very happy to obviously talk afterwards. Um, so um, uh, just to very briefly mention, so I'm a professor at the Code Polytechnique. For those who don't know, it's a university just outside of Paris. And uh, I'm a member of a team that's called Geomerics, called uh, Geometry Driven Numerics, which where we focus basically on uh, things related to geometry uh, very, very broadly. Uh, so, you know, shape analysis, but also uh, simulation and even topological data uh, analysis techniques. So it's kind of a very a big umbrella term. And uh, again, if this is interesting to you, be happy to discuss. And uh, we're, this is a relatively new team, um, and but we're very generously funded. So there are many uh, uh, opportunities for, I don't know, either like visiting or if you want to create a collaborative project together, we're very ha happy to host you. Um, so this is part of the reason why I wanted to reach out because, I mean, I hope that, you know, we can establish some kind of um, uh, connections um, as well. And in my own work, I, I focus especially on geometric da data analysis and my background initially is from computer graphics, but I've been transitioning more to uh, um, machine learning and geometry processing in the past few years. Um, so the general kind of research context for my work, and again, I mean, I don't know what everyone's background is here, but basically I focus especially on uh, processing and analyzing uh, digitized 3D data. And the motivation is that uh, nowadays there's more and more uh, 3D data coming um, from different domains. So, um, you know, probably everyone's heard about like, like image explosion, but in parallel, there's also explosion of other modalities like 3D. Um, and it comes both from uh, sort of traditional domains like computer aided design and animation, computer graphics, but also now it's very easy to have 3D scans of objects, uh, for example, in the context of archeology, span paleontology or biomedical imaging. And so um, I'm actually working with uh, uh, collaborators in all of these domains and they all have their own sources of 3D data and their own interesting problems. And so we're trying to help them solve these problems. Um, and there's a kind of a general let's say challenge that we're trying to address and not just me, but as a community also people working in this domain. And basically the idea is, is that, you know, if you kind of look at the standard success story for uh, let's say deep learning in computer vision, it has at least two you know, main ingredients. First of all, we have a lot of labeled training data and we also have neural networks that can exploit general uh, like regular structure of images, right? So if you're, for example, you know, starting with convolutional neural networks or transformers, they typically have some way of uh, using the fact that an image is just a grid of pixels basically right and this is like a fundamental thing that that, that is exploited now when it comes to um you know uh, basically like the, the, the key question in this domain is how to enable signal aggregation and communication on this domain right so for example on, a, on an image we aggregate uh information by you know having a sequence of convolutional layers let's say in the standard approach 
Um, and this allows us to like have communication within the image across different pixels. And the key question is, if you go to a different representation like 3D, how do you do the same, right? And this is actually very, very tricky because there are many challenges that, that are involved in dealing with 3D data. So first of all, um, uh, the amount of 3D data that we have is very limited. So maybe we have thousands of shapes. I mean, in some cases we have like 10 shapes, you know, for dealing with like archeology, span for example, you know, they have some dig and they're happy to find one shape sometimes, right? So we have a limited amount of data. It's poorly labeled and riddled with noise. So acquisition devices are still not amazing. You have lots of noise. So, you know, you have a, like a scan of a room, it might look like this. Um, and also it comes in many different representations. So if you have a 3D shape, it could be a collection of points. It could also be a, a triangle mesh, uh, which is common in graphics or uh, uh, volumetric data, which is common in medical imaging. So all of these representations, you know, somehow you need to be able to communicate across different representations. And this is very challenging, right? To, to basically do something that would incorporate all of these uh, um, kind of problems together. And so the overall vision of my work and some of the things that I wanted to convey today is basically to enable uh, accurate analysis and deep learning on geometric data in 3D, right? So uh, we have many different sources of data and we have many different problems associated with this data, for example, shape classification, segmentation, correspondence. And our goal is to basically enable, you know, solve these problems, even given these challenges that I just outlined, like limited amount of data, noise, et cetera. Um, and um, there are different approaches for 3D deep learning. I mean, this is not a new domain. I mean, it started, let's say, I don't know, seven, eight years ago. And uh, basically there, there is different categories of dealing with uh, uh, 3D shapes. So there is this, probably the simplest category is if you have a 3D model, you can take 2D views of this 3D model um, and you know, represent a, a shape as just a collection of views um, or um, so, and then you can just use standard convolutional neural networks. There is uh, volumetric representations where you basically have your you know, uh, data on a 3D grid. And then again, you can either use uh, uh, convolutional neural networks that are in 3D or um, you know, something like NERFs or um, implicit surfaces. And so this is kind of just volumetric approaches. Um, there's also approaches based on just representing a shape uh, as a collection of unorganized points. So they're like a famous paper called PointNet and many follow-ups to this, uh, which basically just analyze 3D shapes as a collection of unorganized points. And then also there is a set of approaches that are intrinsic that operate directly on surfaces. Um, and so for today, I wanted to uh, focus on this category of approaches because this is basically the closest to what I've been uh, working on. Although obviously there is merit to all of these categories. Um, so when you're dealing with like intrinsic, so what we call intrinsic deep learning is basically deep learning on the surface. So intrinsic in a sense that you know, I am doing something on the surface of the object. I'm not caring about where I'm positioned in space. That's why it's intrinsic. So there are many tasks for intrinsic deep learning, like segmentation um, uh, or correspondence. And one of the kind of strengths of these types of approaches is that because they don't care about the embedding or like the position in space, you can do this pose invariant. So like a, a method that doesn't care about, you know, if a human is running or standing, it can still perform well for shape segmentation. This is also useful, for instance, in analyzing uh, conformations of molecules that have non-rigid uh, deformations. Um, correspondence is a problem that I'm, I actually talk much more about later. Um, shape classification, again, you know, uh, uh, not caring about uh, um, the pose or other uh, uh, tasks like reconstruction, estimating physical properties, animation, et cetera. And one thing I wanted to mention is that these are not just problems that, you know, occur in, let's say, the research environment where we're just, you know, inventing our own problems and uh, trying to like publish papers, but they're also, you know, real, let's say quote unquote, real world applications for instance in actual like science. So there's a, a paper in Nature Methods from 2020 where they basically try to analyze uh, protein surfaces, so represent protein molecules as uh, surfaces and analyze their properties by using some of the techniques that I am going to present actually in a second. And so for instance, one of the tasks they have is like trying to understand how different proteins interact with each other or predicting electrostatic potential. So you're given a surface and you want to predict, for example, the potential, the electrostatic potential um, on the surface. And that helps you to understand uh, how uh, proteins interact with each other. And then eventually this could lead to drug design. So actually I have an, a collaboration with the Sanofi, which is a big drug manufacturing company, and they're interested in some of these techniques precisely for this reason. Okay, so today, just to make things a little bit more concrete, 
I wanted to focus on one particular problem, which is the problem of shape correspondence. And the problem is very simple to describe. So basically, I'm given a pair of objects, like these two humans. And I'm, my goal is to create a method that for every point on some source shape predicts what is the corresponding point on the target shape, right? Super simple problem to describe. And this is a problem that I've been working for like more than 10 years now. Um, and yeah, it's I find interesting because it, it's kind of uh, deceptively simple. It seems like something you should be able to solve easily, but always there's something interesting coming up. And, you know, for example, if you're dealing with humans, it seems kind of relatively easy. But like if you're dealing with some kind of like archaeological artifacts, it becomes more tricky because, you know, you have to deal with lots of kind of deformations or, you know, we're also trying to analyze some like complex cells. And they're basically like for me as a human, it's impossible to predict like what is the right correspondence. You have to create methods that would be robust to many different kinds of scenarios. Like we don't want to create methods that only work on humans, right? So it should be something geometric engineering. And just to give you another little motivation, so this is, we have a joint project with um, biologists who basically want to uh, understand how uh, cells evolve over time. So they study, for example, uh, cancer cells. And there is, to my am amazement, there is now ways to capture high quality 3D uh, representations of evolving cells. Um, and I guess there's like a bunch of Nobel Prizes associated to this. And so you can see, for instance, this is a little video of a, a, a part of a breast cancer cell um, that evolves over time. They have a resolution of approximately one frame per second, I think. So this is you know, obviously sped up. Um, but you can see that there's like a lot of interesting things happening. Apparently cells like communicate amongst themselves. Um, they have these like tentacles that grow and contract and so on. And so their goal is to basically, um, I mean, the reason we have this project is they want to track this cell over time and try to understand which points, you know, go over time. So here this little, like you can see little dots, Basically, um, these are tracked points, and play this again. So by you know seeing how the different tracked points evolve over time, apparently that gives them some understanding of the behavior, and and this can lead to understanding of like how things work in 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 you know real or organisms. So and underlying this is shape correspondence, basically because you need to given two uh, images of two different uh, uh, cells across two different timestamps. Our goal is to find correspondence. So basically for different points on these two 3D shapes, find which ones correspond to each other. And then if we can do that across all cells, then we can track them over time and then eventually understand the behavior of these cells. So, okay, so this is just a motivation. And um, now how do we solve this problem? So basically there is a, a, a let's say a set of techniques that are under general umbrella of non-Euclidean learning. And uh, I wanted to give like, just maybe a two slide introduction to this for, for those who haven't seen it, because I mean, there are many, many details I'm gonna skip over. So I just wanna give it like a high level idea of how this potentially could work. But if you have questions, I'll be happy to answer, of course. I mean, obviously feel free to interrupt if you have like specific questions about them. Um, okay, so the high level idea of this non-Euclidean learning um, uh, domain is that basically if you have a, a standard image, you can just apply a regular like convolutional neural networks. So you have some like learned filters and the nice thing is that because we have this global parameterization, like a global coordinate system for an image, we have the x, y coordinates, and then we can parameterize like our filters by x, y coordinates. Now, the problem is if you're given a 3D shape, you don't have such a global coordinate system, right? If you want to do it intrinsically. So what do you do? So basically, there's a set of approaches that were popularized by Michael Bronstein and his colleagues. Um, and there's a nice like survey from 2017, an updated version from 2020. Um, and the high level idea is very, very simple. So basically on the surface, we don't have a global parameterization. However, if I pick a point X on the surface, then locally I can parameterize my surface with a little patch. So I can construct some kind of local coordinate system with what they call geodesic polar coordinates. So basically for every point in the neighborhood of X, I can describe it as the distance from X and also some angle with respect to some little like local uh, uh, um, reference direction. Okay, so basically, Around every point X, we can construct a little coordinate system. So this is only purely local. And if we can do this locally, then I can take a signal that's defined on the surface. So this is my signal. And then I can uh, basically multiply it with some learned kernel. So this learned kernel only is a little, little patch that's defined basically in the neighborhood of X. Okay. And if I can do this locally, I can move this kernel around and you know basically mimic convolution on the surface. Right? The patch is on the surface or against? 
uh, the, the patch is, you can think of it as on the surface, but you can also think of it as living like separately from the surface, like just, you know, as it's learned, um, like we have two parameters, rho and theta. Yeah, and then my question was if that patch was staying on top of the hip, like yeah, the hip, yeah. uh, would it have deformed the shape itself or? Yes, it would deform because we always take the, the kernel, the patch, and we overlay it onto the surface, right? So. Basically, around every point we have a coordinate system. Uh, geodesic distance that exactly that using the exact inside. Exactly. Stuff. Okay. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. Does it make sense? Or yeah. 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 So I mean, uh, there are many hidden like issues with this approach. I'm not going to go over that. I mean, I worked in this domain also a little bit, but um, anyway, this is something you can do. And um, so once you take this inner product, you basically multiply the signal on the surface with the with this learned kernel. Then you have a basically a scalar, like a, a value per point, and then you basically have a, a real valued function on the surface. And once you do this, you can stack these kind of uh, uh, convolutional layers into um, in, into layers, and then you have multiple. And the nice thing is that because everything is on the surface, it's pulls invariant. So you know I don't care how I'm positioned because everything is done on the surface. Of the object. Um, and yeah, so this was initially a paper in 2015. And since then, um, many, many other papers came out in this domain and many ways of improving this geodesic convolutional. So th this whole approach is called geodesic convolutional neural networks. So there are many approaches in this domain. I mean, there are literally thousands of references in this area. Again, I'm going to skip over that. Um, but um, uh, so this is the kind of a standard architecture that is used. So you have some input shape, and this shape has some input uh, uh, features, or maybe just the XY coordinate. You pass them through some layers, then you have some learned filters, so there's some kind of filter bank, and then there's an output. Okay, super simple architecture. Now, um, in the context of shape correspondence, there are many ways of modeling this problem. So I just wanted to show one, so you can have a, a general idea of how this works. So suppose that I have some training shapes, some training example shapes, and like let's say X is a training shape, and I also have some template, right? So every training shape has a known ground truth correspondence from every point little X to some point on this template on a reference shape, right? And then during training, what I do is that for every point X, I basically predict the probability distribution, like where does this point go on this template, right? So for every vertex of the template, I have a probability of where should this point go on the on the on the reference shape. And so this is just a standard classification problem. So I can train it with like logistic re regression. So you can immediately see that there's a kind of a little bit of a challenge already because let's say the reference shape has the number of points, which is like the number of points on the surface. So that could be like typically in the order of thousands. So let's say like a standard human shape is represented around like five to 10,000 vertices. So you basically are doing like classification into 10,000 classes, right? And you can imagine you probably need quite a bit of training data for this to work well and to be robust and so on. But you know, people in this domain are kind of not faced by this problem and say, okay, we just train and see what happens. So typically a standard data set for a human shape correspondence is around 100 shapes. So you can imagine, okay, I have 100 shapes in 10,000 classes, like it's going to work, maybe. Um, all right, so in 2015, they had this uh, uh, result, which is basically, so I'm gonna show plots that look like this. So on the, so I have some uh, hidden ground truth uh, correspondence. So this is like the perfect result. And the plots, they on the X axis, there's some error threshold. And on the Y, y axis, um, there's basically how many correspondences that your method produces within this error threshold. So if you have a perfect uh, method, it would produce basically 100% of correspondences, you know, at zero error. So it would be like this. And the better your method is, the closer it is to this kind of perfect result. So these, every line here is a different method. And these, like, for example, the dotted line, these are all methods that existed prior to 2015. And this uh, paper that was, you know, the geodesic convolutional neural network, it produced, you know, correspondence or results that look like this, right? So basically, you know, you can think of like here, for instance, five times 10 to the negative two is around five centimeters. So you have around 90, 5% of correspondence predictions are within five centimeter error of the ground truth. So, I mean, five centimeters, okay. Yeah. Um, but it's not perfect, but you know, kind of like not, not bad at all. It was better than anything that they could. Um, now, in, if you skip forward five years, so 2020, there's a paper that came out and it's, you know, this paper, ACSN, and they reported the results like this, this is a TPR paper. 
And so, you know, it's basically like a perfect prism. Yeah. And they trained on 100, I think they trained in 80 shapes and tested on 20. And so to me, it's like, this is incredible, you know, but basically like, and so this is the error. So you know, like, this is the shape and we're, this is some template shape and this is the average error to zero, basically, or like uh, average error is zero. So it's like, okay, so then, you know, is this problem basically solved? So maybe like, I should, you know, retire, like, that's it, we're done. Um, uh, um, yeah, I was kind of, when I saw it, it was really like a main possible. Um, but now, I mean, again, like I say, with this problem, there's always something that comes up. So um, what happens is the following. The shapes that we're dealing with in these data sets, they have a very fixed particular structure. So if you're, you know, if you know about triangle meshes, you have a, a fixed number of points and a fixed triangle, like fixed connections. So if you think of basically you have like a fixed graph between different points. And now the issue is that if you have meshes, so this graph that are the same during training and testing, then indeed you're basically getting 100% like accuracy, zero there. But if you change the mesh structure even a tiny bit, so you can you actually cannot see that, like because of the uh, uh, you know uh, resolution of the projector, you cannot see the change in the in the change in the mesh. But if you change the mesh even a tiny bit, basically the error explodes. So from zero it goes to like you know something totally just you know noise. So what this means is that this method didn't actually learn something about the underlying geometry of the shape. What it learned is basically the structure of the connectivity of these points. So it overfitted to this graph. It was basically the mesh, right? And of course, it's not practical because when I give you a real shape in the real world, you don't know what kind of mesh you're going to get. You have some acquisition process and some meshing. And so this is like, this is going to be used as a practice. And unfortunately, this was not only the case for this particular method. We've tried many different techniques. And again, if you just uh, train on the same connectivity, but then, you know, you have very like small error, but then as you change the connectivity, even a bit, all of these you know, like methods, they basically, they, 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 collapse, right? they produce some noise. Um, and this is a real issue when you're dealing with 3D models. And like I said, you know, they come in different representations. So you cannot just assume that you have this fixed, you know, a, a mesh structure. You always have to deal with the fact that it might change. Um, so basically the challenge is that we have two main components. We have these geodesic convolutions that I described. There's also something that I didn't describe, which is pooling hierarchies. Again, you can imagine kind of trying to mimic pooling on images on surfaces. And this, like basically you can construct a set of uh, uh, simplified shapes and I'm not gonna get into that, but it's hard. So I'm just gonna say this is uh, like, if you do this, this is a source of, of non-robustness. And so the question that we posed um, to my colleagues is basically like, can we do some learning, but avoid these, uh, uh, these two operations? So basically avoid geodesic convolutions and avoid pooling hierarchies altogether, right? So, um, you know, but still do some kind of learning on the surface. And so I wanted to describe a few papers that came out from this general idea and, you know, hope to convince you that this is some interesting directions that you can get to see. Um, okay, does the problem make sense? Mm -hmm. yes. All right, so um, the overall goal is to basically avoid local parameterizations and enable a robust general purpose surface. So one uh, kind of paper that came out uh, last year um, that initially actually we put it in an archive and called it diffusion is all you need, but now I think this all you need trend is kind of dying down. So we like said, okay, you know, I removed this. So now it's, it's called diffusion net, discretization agnostic learning on surfaces. And this is joint work with Nick Sharp and his advisor Kim McCain at CMU and my students who are taking. So Nick came to, to visit us in, um, at Equipo Technique. It was a really nice collaboration. Um, so basically the idea is that can we take these, you know, building blocks and just remove them and replace them with something else. And in our diffusion net paper, the, what we replace them with are three main components. So we have standard point-wise um, multi-layer perceptrons. So this is kind of very standard. And then we have two building blocks that are specific. And one is learned diffusion and something called, that we call gradient features. And especially the key, the really, the key distinguishing characteristic of this, of this approach is this learned diffusion. And that's what I wanted to really like if there's one thing I wanted to convey today, it would be this, okay? Um, everything else you can do. Uh, so what is, what is this learned diffusion? Um, basically, it's actually very like intuitive, I think, because it has this physical interpretation. So suppose that I have a surface like this hand, and I have some initial source of heat. So for example, I have this point, and then at this point, I have some you know, distribution of heat that's maybe focused, and then like everywhere else is close to zero. If you basically look how, how heat diffuses over time, so you have a partial differential equation, 
that over time, the change in heat is controlled by the heat equation. So this is the Laplace phi to x. Then basically you see that over time, you have this heat that kind of starts local and then diffuses and, and uh, becomes more and more global. And eventually the heat becomes like constant on the surface. And, and so this is a standard partial differential equation. It's super well uh, uh, studied. It's there are implementations you know, for, for simulating heat diffusion. It's extremely robust. And the only thing that you need in order to do this basically have a discretization of the Laplacian on a surface. And also you can do some graphs. So this is probably the most well-studied PD like, in history. Um, so this is this is you know something that exists. And so our key idea is to basically have a uh, uh, a layer, a learnable layer, where we make the diffusion time a learned parameter. Right? So we have some input uh, signal, and then we say, okay, let's take this input signal and let's diffuse it for some amount of time. And that time is going to be the parameter, the learnable parameter of the network. Okay? So the sort of intuitively what this allows us to do is to basically enable communication, so information communication without convolution. So we, you know, imagine that you have some information at stored at this point. We can diffuse this information. So intuitively, we're like propagating this information, and then how far we're propagating is controlled by this learnable time t. Okay. Um, so let me describe a little bit in slightly more detail. So we have uh, what we call a learned diffusion layer, and um, it looks like this. So I have some domain omega, and I have k functions, so k signals, real value signals on this uh, domain. Um, and the, so this is the input to this learned diffusion layer. And the output is also k functions on the same domain, right? So we're not changing either the number of functions or the domain. And the only thing that we're doing is that we take every function, so every, you know, uh, uh, input signal, and then we diffuse it for some learnable time t. And the number of learnable times is exactly, so k is the number of, uh, 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 the number of uh, 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 input signals. So every channel or every input signal has its own learned diffusion. And so we take this input and we diffuse it for some, some amount of time. And the way it's governed is basically uh, is this. So you, there's a closed form expression for how to compute the diffused uh, value given some initial value f0. And it's just uh, this uh, matrix exponential. And the reason I wrote this down, I mean, you don't have to parse this formula, but basically you just have to notice that it's differentiable with respect to t. So if I want to learn this uh, diffusion, uh, diffusion parameter, I have to basically differentiate this equation with respect to t, and you can kind of see that it's differentiable. Is that surprising that you any noise and denoising like general diffusion here? Yes, there there is, except there is no denoising here. We're we're actually, I mean, there's definitely a deep connection, but um, it's more like um, how should I describe it? Smoothing and over smooth. So basically, like, you know, instead of uh, you, so, so you have some input features, right? And we just want to smooth them for some amount of time, right? So it's not exactly denoising, right? It's more like smoothing and, and like unsmoothing. You can think of that, that word. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. So the important thing is that this is the variable per channel spatial support. And, you know, and that was to either have this communication from purely local to totally global. And this, optimized during training. And um, one thing that we can prove, um, and when we say, when I say we, I actually say, I mean, Nick Sharp is the first author. So um, he um, did like the lion's share of this work. So I really want to credit him here. So basically if we have this learnable diffusion layer and pointwise MLPs, we can represent any radially symmetric convolution. Okay? So this is a theoretical result that basically you can prove that just by you know going from convolutions to this learned diffusion, we're not like losing too much information. Um, yeah. How about this provision work? Like, what is the objective? Yeah. So you can think of it as the objective can be exactly the same as what we had before. So this this stuff here. I mean, I'm gonna talk. Maybe if I have time at the end, I might talk about a different way of doing an objective. But you can like this could still be a cross entropy loss. So we have some ground truth correspondences. You know. The only thing that we're changing is the middle architecture, right? The training can be done the same. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, any other questions? When you say it's a learnable parameter, are you just learning a bunch of things? Or like yeah, I'll actually show the actual architecture. It's a little bit more complicated than that. But yeah, more or less, we're learning a bunch of teams, basically. We have a, a, a block, which is a diffusion block, and it has 
you know, these K channels, and for every channel, it was kind of like And see, because that's how much smoothing. Exactly, how much smoothing for every channel, and just per channel. Yeah, other questions? Okay, so what there's one last thing that uh, that we need that maybe I don't know, in the interest of time I can actually skip a little bit, but basically, so radially symmetric filters are you know these kinds of filters that don't depend on the orientation, and like if you just have diffusion and MLPs, that's only that's the only thing you can represent. The reason being is the diffusion or smoothing is a isotropic uh, operation. It doesn't care about like where the direction, so everything's smooth the same way like across, and sometimes. Uh, it's okay, but sometimes you might need filters that actually do care about directions. And so we have a way to uh, um, basically incorporate direction by taking gradients, gradients of features, and then taking inner products between gradients. So, I mean, it's just something that we do. I don't necessarily advocate it's like not the best way of doing it, but anyway, this is there's a way to basically incorporate some directionality by taking gradients of features. Okay. Um, and so this is our architecture. So we have some input. Um, we project it onto some bases where basically uh, uh, simulating diffusion may, becomes easier. Then we have a learned diffusion per feature, and then we kind of go back to the full bases, and then we have this spatial uh, gradient feature where we have the uh, learned inner products, and then there's some MLPs that are per, per vertex with shared weights across different vertices. So this is a single what we call diffusion block, and then you can stack these blocks together where you have some input uh, signal and you have some output you know, signal with some loss. Right. And so this is what we learned. So uh, here there's a learnable uh, diffusion time. Here there is a learnable uh, uh, inner, like pairwise inner product matrix. And here there's a weights of the MLPs. These are the things that are learned. Um, okay. And so, yeah, so this is the architecture. It doesn't have any of these local geodesic parameterizations or anything like that. It only has this learnable diffusion and, and MLPs and these gradients. And so as a result, it's extremely robust and basically a cheap state of the art on, on many, many uh, uh, different benchmarks. Um, so yeah, uh, I should say, I mean, this is 2022 and still I think it's quite popular. I mean, I don't know, maybe with, like without false modesty, like it's become a relatively popular method in this domain. So if you ever do like learning on surfaces, I would recommend at least to try it because it's very robust and very efficient. Um, and so it achieves state of the art on, on, on many different benchmarks. Um, so here's like we did some like segmentation of RNA molecules, uh, segmentation of humans across different like types of meshes, and I mean so my like students Swave and, and Nick they did an incredible amount of like testing and benchmarking and it and it and is always at least competitive. Um, and one thing that I'm especially excited about is that you know these issues that I showed in the beginning where we had you know the changes if you change the mesh then the method explodes. Basically, our, uh, is the only method it, that remains stable if you change the mesh structure. No, so that's the thing. You change, you you train on the original like fixed connectivity, and then you test on any connectivity you want, and it still works. Um, the reason is that because basically, intuitively, to me, well, okay, let me first of all say that it does. It is not. Completely full proof. So it does change. So it's like the error goes from 0 0.3 to 0 0.6, but it's like better than 0. You know, 0 0.05 to 35. Right? So, <laughs> so, you know, it does increase. So, like, it's not completely insensitive. It's just much, much more robust. And the reason why it's more robust is basically because diffusion is a not a, you know, it's, it's a very robust operation. It's not sensitive to the structure of the mesh. It's something that, you know, is really underlying like how the geometry of the surface is like positioned, and it's not about how the connectivity of the mesh is done. And also, we kind of leverage the fact that like you know simulating heat has been studied to death. So there are many different robust techniques for simulating diffusion, and it's, and so it's you know, we basically also inherit some of the robustness from that. And the last thing that also is important is that we do this diffusion in a reduced basis. So we project into some like low frequency basis, do diffusion there and then go back. And so this is like a, a, a low pass filter that makes the whole thing. Um, You're showing us uh, 3D uh, representations, but I assume this also applies to higher dimensional uh, like surfaces and also maybe as well, or are there any applications that can be 
immediately think of. So I'll show something a tiny bit later on graphs where we do the same thing basically. And graph basically is not embedded. So it could be in high dimension embedding, it could be just an activity. I mean, in principle, as soon as you have a uh, Laplacian, you could use this kind of approach. In our architecture, there is, so this gradient features, they are actually specific to surfaces because you need to take a, you know, on a surface, you have a signal and you have a like gradient that you know, basically lives in the tangent space. So depending on the, on the dimensionality of your surface and like if it's, you know, co-dimension one with respect to the underlying ambient space. So, so that's, there are some small things, but in principle, yes, there, there's no limitation. You can at least try it. Yeah. Any, any. In 2D, we also even tried it in 2D, like on images. Um, the thing is that, I mean, it does something, it's okay. But the problem is like, it's not competitive with respect to something that really exploits, you know, the yeah, global well, when I the space more like bigger. Hmm. Yeah, maybe, yeah. I, mean, I, I don't think that's a good. Uh, oops. Okay, so maybe, yeah, one last thing I wanted to say is that everything is incredibly, that uh, works, incredibly, it's very efficient. So um, you have, uh, you know, for example, if you have like dense meshes with like 150,000 vertices, we can still do training because everything is like in a reduced basis. So it's very fast. So if you have like uh, 42 milliseconds per shape, um, which, and so you can train very, very quickly for 13 million vertex um, shapes. So it's not, it's not, it's not expensive in the sense that like, you know, for example, transformers can be expensive with the dense patterns communication um, and relatively memory efficient. So I think that's also part of the reason why, um, at least you know, like other people have tried it because it's very easy to try. Just upload it. And you don't need to have some like very reduced representation. Okay, so this is the diffusion net, and I, and then for the rest of whatever I have like you know, 10, 15 minutes, I wanted to talk a little bit about some extensions. Um, and you know I didn't give you the, all the technical details of the first part. And I'll give you even less technical details for the other parts, but again, just wanted to give you like a general sense of what you know, trying to do. So the first project is um, on partial shape correspondence. So um, what we call deep partial functional maps. And uh, this is also a joint work with Suhib um, uh, Dehi, who's my student and Waldo from Rob And basically the problem here is that so far I've been talking about, you know, finding mappings or correspondences between shapes where for every input point, there is some target, okay? But in practice, you might have these, you know, maybe only a partial scan, like you have a 3D scanner, but only acquired, you know, a part of the uh, surface of, 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 of the person, or maybe you have some archeological artifact and it's broken. So you need to be able to find correspondences even when they're missing parts, right? So that's why it's called partial matching where some parts are missing. So here, for instance, this gray thing, the, the gray part on the source shape doesn't exist on the other shape. Or maybe you even have two shapes where there are gray parts that basically need it. So this one doesn't exist on the, on the target, but this one also doesn't exist on the source. Right? So you have, you have to be able to somehow handle these partialities. Um, and um, so the solution that we proposed is a architecture that's also based on this diffusion net, but it does two things. It first predicts the overlap. So we have a part, you know, an input two shapes, X and Y, we run them through this diffusion blocks. And now we have two outputs. We have basically an output that produces a correspondence. So you can think of it as like what I did before, but we also have an output that predicts an overlap. So for every, like for this shape, it will basically try to predict which part of the shape exists on the target. And similarly for this shape, which part of this shape exists on the source. So we have this overlap prediction block. And um, essentially, um, uh, intuitively, like if I have these two shapes, intuitively what it does is like kind of weighs them. So I have some features, it puts uh, the oops, parts of those features that are that don't exist on the target to zero. Right? So here, for instance, it doesn't like this back of the cat doesn't exist on the target. So the feature will be weighed to zero. And here this left side of the cat doesn't exist on the source. So the feature will be uh, weighed to zero. And so 
the way that we achieve this is basically we combine this diffusion with a cross attention law. So we have some uh, attention mechanism that takes some features from the two shapes, combine them together, and not as a prediction, but like where the points exist. Yeah, it's, in principle, it's binary, but when we try, train it in kind of soft. Um, so during training, it's binary, like we know it's zero, but um, yeah, we try to predict soft. Sorry? It's a little sad to look at you know. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Pitful, yeah, yeah, you're right. What happened to the cat, the poor cat? That's true, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we need some maybe like uh uh amphora or something like less <laughs> animal. But the reason why we have these cats is because um well, you know, one of the reasons that it's it's non-rigid, right? So we want to deal with shapes that are non-rigid, so they're you know doing some deformations and also partial. Like if you have some, you know, archaeological artifact is typically rigid, it doesn't deform, so that's why we have these kind of yeah, yeah, I mean okay, and so again, I mean skipping some technical details, we you know uh, performed um, comparison to many, many different techniques. But one thing I want to mention is that so at, you know this was let's say we achieved the best results at the time, but there's a huge gap between what is possible between, like for partial shapes and what is possible for uh, complete shapes. So like at least, you know, maybe double the error that we get. But, you know, this is not just for us, it's for any method. So there's a huge, you know, like room for improvement. I think that's really a problem that hasn't been solved or like it's quite far from being solved. If you have some good ideas for like partial and unrated shape response, you can you know, make become famous by closing this gap. There's really a lot of room for improvement. I mean, this is one of the things I want to um, yeah, and we also introduced some data sets. Um, so I mean, that was, I think, part of the big work that was done by Sweep and Gautam is creating new, new data sets where, you know, just to make it more challenging, we have like changes in the mesh structure, changes in the in partiality, like really severe partiality sometimes, where you have like only like a leg. Um, and again, I mean, basically most, I would say that, you know, most methods fail in this domain. <laughs> Ours fails the least, let's say, but it's not like, you know, we are, Good. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Okay. Um, and one more thing that I wanted. To... Okay, so this is this partial shape matching, and the one maybe last thing in the interest of time, I save time for questions, is uh, uh, a very recent extension that just appeared at ICML. Uh, um, it's learning on graphs. Okay, and the question that. Um, we have is can we do something similar for learn for, for learning on, on graphs, right? Instead of surfaces. And graphs, of course, are very prevalent. I mean, you can many, you can model many interactions as a graph, right? And so if you can do like learning on a graph, it's very powerful. Um, so we have this uh, paper called Thai Time Derivative Diffusion for Deep Learning on Graphs. And this was joint work with an intern, um, and Max Grant, and, and a postdoc in the group and so on. Backbench. And so uh, just to quickly kind of introduce the high level idea is that what we would like to do is basically enable learnable pro information propagation on graphs. So imagine that you have this graph structure. So here, the, I'm just visualizing it in 2D, but actually the nodes don't have any coordinates. Okay? So we just have some uh, uh, you know, graph where have some connectivity. And I would like to basically um, you know, enable some information communication between, let's say, one node and, and other nodes within this graph. And if I can do that and create a, a layer out of this, then I can create Let's say a, a deep uh, learning. Um, and so initially, what we thought was, um, well, let's take this diffusion net idea and just apply it directly. Right? I mean, like you have Laplace and it's defined in a graph, you can do exactly the same thing. And then um, maybe we just, you know, that's that's it. That's the whole project. You know, we're done. <laughs> um, just convert our definitions from surface to graph and then hopefully to the Now, the problem is it didn't, or at least it worked, but it wasn't competitive. Like we didn't achieve, you know, high quality results compared to baselines. And so it was a bit sad. We're like stuck for a while. Like what should we do? You know, just like maybe this is a bad idea. Like why does it not work? And the observation that we had, and this I find interesting. Um, so this is like what I wanted to mention is that the standard diffusion, um, it makes local communication difficult. So on a graph, Sometimes, so sometimes, like for example, on a surface, 
we don't care about the mesh, right? So I don't care if, for example, I want to communicate like one hop distance or two hops. The mesh itself is a kind of artificial construct. What I really care about is the geometry, right? So I don't want to rely too much on the mesh. But on a graph, you actually do want to rely on the connectivity sometimes because it's really telling telling you something. These two people, for example, if you have a collaborative network, like these two people, you know, work together. So it's really saying something about you know their relationship. You don't want to ignore that information. So you don't want to like smooth it out completely. So the observation that we had is that standard diffusion makes local communication difficult. So basically, sometimes I really want to have just local communication, like between two hot neighbors, and that's it. Like I don't want to diffuse it to some far away thing. And with standard diffusion, it's actually tricky to model purely local communication. Are these good graphs? Uh, most of them, yes, although there are some also unweighted. We, we have both weighted. What changes is the definition of the Laplace. So it's like right, weight correlation. Yeah, they're both. Um, yeah. So, so we had this observation, and then we said, OK, maybe what we should do is we should Take a, you know this diffusion, and then we should maybe have a one branch of the network that allows local communication, and one branch of the network that allows the diffusion communication, and then we should somehow combine them. And so, like Max, uh, my son, they really tried hard, and they got some decent results. But like aesthetically, it was really ugly. You know, you have these like different ways of communicating. Like, is there some like common principle that you can do jointly? And so, ultimately, what we came up with is, I think, much more let's say, aesthetically compelling. And so the idea is that instead of using the diffusion operator, let's use basically the time derivative diffusion. So what does that mean? So diffusion equation is governed by this equation. So at time t, I have some basically like matrix exponential times some initial uh, um, initial distribution of heat at time zero. Now, if you take the derivative of both of these uh, uh, at, uh, with respect to t, both sides, then what you get is the derivative at time t is uh, equal to the Laplacian times the basically the diffusion. Okay. So you know you're just taking the derivative, so you have like L that falls out, and then you have the same. Now, but the thing is, I mean, this is like super simple, but I wanted to really emphasize this. Why? Because there's something magic that happens. That now, if you plug in t equals to zero into this equation, then you basically get L. Right? If you plug in t equals to zero, you get f zero. So basically, at t equals to zero, this this equation tells you don't do anything. Like if I have an initial distribution of heat at time zero, and I basically plug in t equals to zero, it does nothing. It just like the the heat remains the same. But here, if I plug in t equals to zero, I get l, and l is a basically a Laplacian, which is a local communication operator. And so what this means is that if the network wants to enable local communication, all it has to do is just put in t equals to zero. And so the more, like the closer t equals to zero, the more it becomes local and you know it becomes an actual one hop uh, communication. And there's a very nice, again, I'm not gonna go into it, but there's a nice connection to wavelets. If you ever study wavelets, basically there is a family of wavelets that are derived by taking derivatives of heat. So for instance, the Mexican hat wavelet is a derivative of Gaussian. And Gaussian is like the heat kernel in equilibrium space. So this is essentially like doing wavelets on graphs. And so um, this leads to a learnable parameter where you have some input uh, features, and then we have these blocks, and each block has uh, this structure where we have this learnable uh, time derivative diffusion with some coefficients w, which are learned, and uh, and we also have the, the time that was learned. So we have two things that are learned, uh, w and tk. And we don't have these multiple branches in you know, things communicating. All we have to do is just learn the w and t. And and um, it's okay. And yeah, so basically, what this allows you to do is to to uh, uh, enable long range communication without over smoothing. So over smoothing is a term that's I don't know if you ever like work in graph deep learning. Well, there's a well known thing that if you stack multiple layers and multiple means like three already, <laughs> like beyond three layers, it becomes really hard to learn. And a single graph learning layer only allows you communication within like a single hop. And so if you want to communicate within like more than three hop neighborhood, it is difficult to train um, graph neural networks typically. But this kind of technique allows you to have long range communication because you can basically diffuse for as long as you want. And so you have long range communication without over -speed. And um, because of this, you know, we ran on a bunch of benchmarks. I have to say this domain, like the way that people do benchmarks in this domain, I find a bit questionable, but uh, no offense to 
to anyone working that for uh, deep learning. But uh, anyway, this was a tremendous amount of effort to show that this approach uh, actually. Yeah, well, that's the problem. I mean, people are, I mean, we, it took us two, two submissions and the first time we were like, uh, yeah, you have to like, <laughs> you know, the, the way you do experiments is not the same as what these other people did. But everyone tweaks their parameters a bit and it's really hard, you know, because like they publish some results, but if you run their code, you get a different result. So you don't want to be mean. Like you don't also want to annoy the, the, the authors. You try to do some kind of like a gentle criticism. <laughs> but yeah, that was... But we, so we did these experiments. We also did other experiments in other domains where like you clearly need long range communication. So there's like more synthetic uh, experiments. That, but really you can see that long range communications. Um, okay. So yeah, so this is basically this learning on graphs. And I mean, if you're interested, this is a paper that just, just came out very recently. Um, I had one last um, extension, but I'm maybe gonna skip it just in case there are questions. So um, maybe I just go. Go to just the end. Um, so yeah, this is kind of what I wanted to present, and um, I maybe just wanted to mention some things that we are working on now because I think this is just let me say like a cross section of some of the topics. Um, and so just to tell you, like, okay, there's many other things going on. So first of all, um, you know, we're working on how to use some of these similar techniques for unsupervised feature learning. So in three D, it's very very important to do. Um, um, like, unsup like unsupervised training or training with little training data. So for instance, my second DRC is, 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 is on that. It's basically how to do um, like training with little training data. So that's, it's interesting because you have to be kind of creative of like how to extract, you know, high quality features and maybe transfer features from 2D to 3D and so on. Um, so also transfer learning for 3D and graph data is super useful. So I talked about shape correspondence, but actually there's another nice application for shape correspondence, just transfer learning. If you learn something on one domain and you have a correspondence, you can then transfer that information to another domain and maybe do some fine tuning. So there's a nice link there. Um, also, you know, shape and graph correspondence and comparison in many different domains is something I'm interested in. Um, I'm also working, I didn't talk about this too much, but I have some projects on generative 3D, 3D modeling. And I think some very exciting opportunities for connecting 3D with other modalities like text, images, graphs, and images, et cetera. So yeah, I wanna thank my incredible collaborators and my funding agencies and thank you for your Thanks a lot, Max, for this great talk. Thank Are there any questions? Yes. Thank you for your talk, Dr. Thank you. Uh, I was wondering if you uh, well, slightly different models first that you were working on like shape correspondence and different like mannequin meshes. Yes. I was wondering if you think it would be possible to extend that like a giant domain where you have not just two things that you're mm -hmm. trying to find a correspondence with, but like a sequence of Yes. 1,000 mannequins. Mm. Okay, can I find correspondence with mm -hmm. Thanks. Yeah. Do you think that would be possible? It would definitely be possible. And actually, there's, I mean, this is a great question. Thank you. So I showed this example here. So here we actually have a time series, right? So this is not just, you know, pairs. There is a notion of time. And um, we, I mean, this is an ongoing project. It hasn't been published or submitted even yet, but in order to produce these results, we had to introduce some kind of a time coherence. And, but the way that we do it, I think it's kind of suboptimal. So I think there's some room for improvement. So what we do now, I can tell you very briefly, is that there's this notion of consistency. There's a loop closure. Maybe you've seen like, if you go from shape A to shape B, from shape B to shape C, and then back to A, you want to basically come back to like where you started from. And, you know, if you have a time series, there's a like natural notion of order. So we have this loop closure on little time fragments. Like we want to make all the correspondences consistent within these little like time sequences. Um, I mean, it's something we do, but I feel like there's maybe a better way to incorporate time, honestly. So yeah, I think there's some room for improvement. I mean, I agree, this is a good, good, good problem. I don't think there are some specific uh, colored pixels on there. Are those like important? Uh, they are chosen, I think, randomly. There's just one way, one of the ways to visualize a, a correspondence because here we're tracking points over time. I think there's just random points that are tracked. And do you successfully track them without missing them throughout the time frame? I mean, the notion of successful here is a bit difficult to define <laughs> because, you know, this is some living organism and there's no ground truth. Um, but according to the biologist, it seems like it's doing something meaningful. That's the best I can say. Okay.
Any other questions? Maybe I'll follow them. I have a question actually. You yes. said you are teaching on occupied learning. Yes. Yes. Are there more data already? Yes, a yes, lot more. Yeah. 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 Yes. Yeah. Exactly. So there is a, the largest data set is the at least the one that I know, it's called the ABC data set. It's a 3D data set with around a million meshes and they're unlabeled. I mean, there's some very like rough labels of normal, actually, but I mean, it's basically unlabeled. So you have unlabeled, like at least like this data set of a million and there are other, there's this objectverse, which is weekly labeled. I mean, there's some classes and categories around 800,000 things from Facebook, 800,000 shapes. I would call it like, I mean, weekly labeled or close to unlabeled, but basically if you are willing to go to unlabeled, I, I think that it probably, at least I don't have like one approach. I mean, I feel like it deserves, you know, a whole uh, range of, uh, you know, things to try. One thing that maybe I just very briefly can say is that, um, so, you know, so far I talked about un, um, like uh, supervised learning supervised shape correspondence. And here, maybe I just show one like very brief thing is that uh, there's a way to train uh, correspondence methods without using explicit supervision, like ground truth, just by using some geometric, uh, let's say objectives, right? So for example, we know that correspondences have certain structure, like, so like bijectivity, like if I go from shape one to shape two, and then from shape two to shape one, I should go, come back to identity. Right? So this is a, basically a law that you can use. And if you have a bunch of shapes that you believe there is some underlying correspondence, even though you don't know what they are, you can use these like training objectives. And what's interesting is that if you do this, you can actually extract some very meaningful features and even sometimes outperform supervised training methods. Um, so we have a sequence of papers that started in 2019. And then since then we have a bunch of papers that basically like that do this unsupervised uh, shape matching. and as a so there it has two aspects first it's unsupervised so it creates correspondences without labels but another thing that i think is really interesting there was a we had a paper at cpr this year that as a byproduct not only do, do these methods produce correspondence but they also learn some interesting features because they're purely geometric they have some interesting like meaning then you can use in some downstream tasks even if you don't care about shape correspondence you can use this technique to like learn some features and then use those features for example for shape like segmentation so that's a direction that I think is promising. I mean, we tried, like, there's some, like, initial results, in it, but I think we probably need to just... Okay. Okay. Exactly. exactly. Uh, I, I can ask something again. Uh, thank you again, Max, for this uh, post graph quality presentation uh, after the kill one. Uh, so uh, you, your revolutionary functional maps uh, is everywhere and uh, it is also very suitable for geometric learning. Uh, so do, do you work on or think about uh, some bases other than Laplacian bases that go uh, even better with this geometric stuff or is the functional map uh, framework just the perfect fit for this action? Okay, I think, um, I guess, I mean, thanks, Yusuf, for this really nice question. I mean, I didn't really talk about functional maps today, in part because it requires a little bit of introduction, yeah. no notions. Um, yeah, yeah. The personal but, question. <laughs> yeah, personal question, personal interest. Um, I mean, basically, uh, maybe to translate the question for those who, you know, didn't, <laughs> didn't follow or haven't seen this, um, one thing that you can do is maybe I... When we're dealing with shape matching, there are two ways at least to represent a correspondence. You can either say for every point A, where does it go on point B? But also there's another way where instead of looking at pairs of points, you can look at pairs of functions. So like if you have a, like here I'm, I have a shape and I have like some heat, which is like how much, you know, let's say a real valued function. And if I have these corresponding functions, I can express each function in some like linear basis, like a Fourier basis basically on the surface. And then there is what, what we call a functional map, which is a matrix that translates between coefficients in one basis to coefficients in the other basis, right? And um, Yusuf's question is like, so far, you know, this is a, an approach that we introduced in 2012. And 
traditionally, we basically work in the Fourier basis, which is the Laplacian Hutton basis, like in surfaces. Okay. Now, the question is like, are there better bases? And um, well, I think I have some partial answers in the sense that like we have some, we had a paper with NURBS 2020, I think, where we learned the basis. And so we show that in that work that like you can do better than the Laplacian basis, um, for example, on um, point clouds, right? Um, so that was a nice result for me because on point clouds, it's hard to define a Fourier basis. Um, also, there are some results where you're, if you're dealing with partial shapes, you can do a better basis, like a wavelet type basis. There's also some like partial results there. But I'm also, I would say, I'm kind of amazed how well the Laplacian basis works. It's really hard to, to, to outperform. I think there's some theoretical optimality results for, for the Laplacian basis. So um, yeah, I think if you're dealing with like non-rigid shapes, approximately isometric, even you know somewhat isometric, <laughs> It's 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 the Laplacian base is basically optimal. But if you have point clouds or maybe some really non-isometric shapes, maybe partial shapes, there's some slightly better bases. Thanks, Mix. Thank you. Thanks everyone for joining our room and we will share the recording if you know if you want to watch the video. Thanks everyone. Thank you.